work it, make it, do it, make sense. Welcome. Nice to see so many people. I'll start with the typical Oracle disclaimer notice. Um, this presentation isn't a success story. So if you want to hear success stories, there are a lot of microservice success stories, go there. This is not one of them. This is also another story about failure. It's just a story about our project, how we solve problems, how you might solve problems, with ups and downs, pros and cons. A little bit about me. Um, I don't actually, I work, I do a project for the Port of Rotterdam. They're hosted in this building, somewhere around here. But I'm a contractor, so I've also worked for the city of Rotterdam, and they are located here. So that was my previous assignment. This is my current assignment. So yeah, that's Rotterdam, the best city in the world. So a little bit, a little bit about the port itself. And our application is called Hamis. The port of Rotterdam in Europe is the largest port. It was the largest port in the world until uh, um, Asia stepped in, they've got a huge harbor in Saigon, for example. I think it's now the fifth largest in the world. But in Europe, it's, it's by far the largest port. So, well, we're all nerds, so we like statistics, some statistics. So, yeah, a lot of vessels and a lot, a lot of tons of goods that travel in and out of the harbor. The guy you see over there, that's the harbor master. Um, actually, the, the Port of Rotterdam is, is basically two companies. The first company is a commercial company. They own all the land and the water itself, and you have to pay fees to enter the harbor, for example. And it, that's the commercial part. The second part of the, Rotter, the Port of Rotterdam is basically everything below the harbor master. The harbor master is government, um, and it's separated. So he's responsible for safety, the other part's responsible for the commercial stuff. So that's why they separated out. Our system is for the harbor master, so it's not for the commercial part of the port. What does our application do, what we make? Hamis. A lot. It's a huge application. We've got an interactive map. Um, uh, we do security, admits policies. There are patrol, patrol vessels patrolling the water. They're also using our application and they communicate with each other. If there's a crisis, the crisis control is handled by our application. Um, inspectors go on board all the vessels. They inspect all the cargo. That's also done using our application with checklists. Um, our application is also running in Amsterdam. They've got a huge lock complex. Um, so the planning of the lock, all the ships going in and out, is also done in our application. And basically all the communication that happens in the harbor, between the harbor master and the vessels and the agents, is our big application. The history. We started out with IVS. That was a, uh, a console-based application. And it had a problem. The hardware was running out. This was back in, in 2004. So the hardware wasn't being made anymore. We had to scour Craigslist and eBay to find and buy hardware. By then, we knew we had to think about a replacement project. Because it's a government uh, procedure, we had to, to do a, a procurement for this application. It was filed in 2006. And in 2008, we had a project. We had 15 plus architects, one developer, and they were using IBM WebSphere Partner Gateway. True story, 15 plus developers of uh, architects, one developer. Funny thing, that one developer is still working on this application, and it's not me. So a year later, the project was put on hold. The only thing they had at that point was 100 plus pages of blueprints. So, well, that was an achievement unlocked. But no code. Uh, well, there was one developer, he made some code, but nothing was running in production, nothing was ready. A couple of months later, they decided to do it differently. They ditched all the architects, and instead they hired developers, and they started to adopt Scrum. After the first sprint, 
um, three week sprint. We had a working application in production that I think it's the, the, the checklist. They had a paper checklist and we made a digital checklist. We had that running in production after three weeks. And from that point on, the inspectors would use our application. A couple of months later, I joined the team. Um, this is me without a beard, seven or eight years ago, maybe. Look, oh, now I've got a beard. Now you recognize me. And this is, a, this is an example of the map uh, that's in our application. Uh, if you go to the main harbor room in the, the, the building I showed earlier, there is like a video wall with eight screens or something. We have performance problems, uh, but yeah, we couldn't debug at that location. So I uh, went to a store, scoured some monitors, um, put some extra graphic cards in my PC, and well, I, I had this running. After a couple of years, sprint number 70, we could turn off IVS, so we had cake. And that obviously was a very exciting moment. <laughs> this is where the matting's happening. This is the only guy that's actually doing something in the picture. He's turning off the old system. We, on the other hand, were very anxious. No, we're not. It was very boring because we have been using the Agile mythology over, the, over the, the years before, all the users had already been migrated. The system wasn't doing anything. It was just running, but nobody was using it. So it was like we're building up to that moment where we can turn off this application. We were working years and years so we could finally turn off that application. And when the moment came, we were like, eh, turn it off. Oh yeah, it's off now. <sighs> Cake. <laughs> so it, it was really, but yeah, so that's a downside of Agile. A <laughs> couple of sprints later, sprint 100. Uh, so the application keeps growing. So we managed to um, turn off the old system, all the functionalities in the new system. But yeah, it's been, I don't know, almost 10 years. People want new things. Uh, in 2004, nobody had tablets. Right now, they have tablets. They want our application to work on a tablet. So we keep developing and we keep developing. And a year later, we need microservices. Why? We need them. A little bit about the team. Um, currently, there are five teams with about five people in each, uh, uh, five persons in each team, and we're working on the same code base, and we are 100% cross-functional. There are experts. We've got one database expert. He's the expert of Oracle. But if I need to do something with the database, I do something in the database. If I can't do it or I need to learn it, I go to him. He teaches me how next time I can do it. So what does the application look like? Well, this is one screenshot. Um, we have a lot of tabs, so I can't really show everything in the application because it's huge. Um, but it's fully customizable. You can drag and drop everything. Um, like, like you see, we have an interactive map. This was completely made in Swing. Um, you can click on the vessels, and the vessels are live, live images. Uh, they move around, and it's fun. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can do a demo. Um, and the application is offline available, which is in the age of um, in the age of the internet with all the HTML5 stuff. We don't have that very often, but our inspectors really need that because they go on board a ship. And a ship is one big K of Faraday. So there's absolutely no way to get Wi-Fi or 4G. Or, so there's no way to get internet. So they need to be able to start up the laptop. Because if there's oil, uh, gasoline on the ship, you are not allowed to have your laptop open instead of certain areas. So in that area, they need to start up their uh, laptop, start the application offline, do everything offline, close it, go back to the office, and then upload the results. So that's something to keep in mind. So how do we make this? As you can see, there's a front, uh, front end. We used Java Web Start, um, which is cached locally. Uh, Jita, Jite, a docking framework, and basically swing panels. 
Communication to the backend is done using Hessian. Has anyone used Hessian? It's a binary protocol where you can just send to Java objects, so you don't need to do REST. And because our front end and back end is both Java, easy. Just send to Java objects. No need to serialize them. Well, they're serialized, of course. No need to make them into REST or, or uh, XML calls or something. The back end itself is one big Java E application. It was running in uh, Yables application server, which now be migrated to Wildfly 10. We have two nodes running in production. Um, they've got some shared state. Horrible design decision, but yeah, they've got shared state. There are actually stories right now to remove the shared state, but for that we're using Hazelcast. And there's an Oracle database with Hibernate. Like the thing you would pick in 2006, that's what we have. So, what have we learned in all those years? Like I said, we are 100% cross-functional, and what we do a lot is teach each other. Because also teaching is something, teaching is learning something the second time over. When I was writing this talk, I got ideas about how we, sh how we should change, what we should change in our project, just because I'm telling you about my own project. And sometimes when you have a problem and you go to, to someone with your problem and you explain the problem, that's when you yourself realize what the solution is. Another thing we always do is experiment. So we do a lot of proof of concept. Is it successful? Great. Is it, if it's unsuccessful, even better, because then you know the limitations. If your, if your proof of concept is, is a success, well, maybe there's some hidden limitation you haven't found yet. So we're, we are never sad if a proof of concept fails. That's something we encourage. Our project does have a lot of bureaucracy. And uh, James C. Collins says, bureaucracy is compensating for incompetence and lack of discipline. Which took me a while, but then I was reading about his spiral of bureaucracy. He says, a project grows. There are more actors, more functionality. It grows. That's when complexity creeps in. You can't really oversee what's happening. You, you get the feeling you, you, ha you don't have the grip. That's when you need to manage this. So that's when you need, you add managers, you add rules and paperwork, and you start to standardize procedures. But that's also when creativity decreases, responsibility decreases, and when you get bureaucracy. One thing we've seen this um, was with um, the definition of done. So we started doing Agile. In Agile, you have a definition of done. That's like, you have to have this, with maybe five or six points. So make sure your code is tested, that kind of stuff. But each time something went wrong, or the first thing we did was we added it to the definition of done. And in the end, we had 40, 45 points on our definition of done list. Excellent. Turns out, no, you should never do this. Because if you have 45 points on your definition of done list, nobody's going to check them all. Because that's, that's silly work. Also, your responsibility decreases. I don't have to think about what I'm doing. It will be in the checklist, which I'm not following. So that's like, OK, we need more definition of done, more definition of done, more definition of done. OK, let's just ditch the entire definition of done and start thinking again. And then the problems start happening. OK, we need a little bit of definition of done, and we need more. We've, we've went like this for, for 10 times, maybe. And that, that wave of adjustment, that's, that's something we see all the time. Like, we need to do more stand-ups, more stand-ups. Oh, we're doing a lot of stand-up. It takes too long. We're, we're saying too much things. We need to cut back the stand-up time. Okay, now I don't know what everything's doing, so we need maybe a little bit more time. It's very hard to find a balance in that, that kind of thing. Um, like I said, we did Scrum, Agile, and it's a set of best practices. What we've learned, don't just apply the rules, uh, don't just follow all the rules, apply them where needed. Once in a while, ask yourself, why am I doing a stand-up? 
And if you can't answer that, well, maybe you should either stop or change something, because this is actually something we did last year. I asked my team, why are we doing a stand-up? And they, they really couldn't answer. We're just telling uh, ourselves what we're doing. We're with five people. We're using Slack the entire day. If you have a problem and you pick up some new work, you put it in Slack. It's asynchronous. I'm not bothered, but I can read it at any time. During the day, I always know what my team is doing. We don't need to do stand-ups. So we quit doing stand-ups. There was no real reason. It was adding nothing. So we just quit doing stand-ups. And we're still not missing it. So basically, don't do agile. Don't follow the rules blindly. Be agile. So this was an interesting uh, picture. Um, if something is visible and it's a good thing, that's what we call features. If it's visible and it's a bad thing, that's what we call bugs. The things that are interesting are the invisible things. If it's invisible and it's a good thing, that's generally what we say is architecture. And if it's invisible and it's a negative thing, that's what we label technical depth. Something to keep in mind. And that's why architecture is difficult to... to yeah, you don't really notice it. It brings something positive, but you can't see it. So a little bit about the spiral of technical debt. We've experienced this a lot. The velocity goes down. Your manager gets angry. So you start to take shortcuts. And you focus on the functionality instead of good architecture and quality. The velocity goes down even more because you aren't paying attention at the quality and good architecture. You take more shortcuts. And you can see where this is going. In our project, uh, we've had maybe four or five times where the technical debt became so large and we had to stop, just stop all functionality. We need to fix some shit now. So we had this last December again. We had problems with ActiveMQ. Uh, we had problems with dividing, uh, dividing certain parts into microservices. And we just decided we need to stop right now. No new functionality. First, we need to clean everything up. And basically, that's the only idea, uh, the only way to break this spiral once in a while. Just stop, fix all the bugs, and uh, continue. So what is architecture? If you look at Wikipedia, they say software architecture is about making fundamental structural choices which are costly to change once it's implemented. And that's interesting. The first architect we had, his name was Victor, he said, we can do better than that. Always try to design for change. And once we did that, yeah, it isn't a problem anymore. Well, of course, there are still things that are hard to change, but we try to eliminate those. And most of the time, we are successful in that. What we are doing is just-in-time architecture. Find the last responsible moment to make a decision. Because if you make a decision up front, you're making one with very limited knowledge. If you wait to the last responsible moment, you know as much as possible about the problem you have. That's when you need to make the decision. And always do the simplest thing that could work. Don't make it complex, do the simplest thing that could possibly work. And simplicity is really the key in being agile. For me, every line of code we write is part of the architecture. It isn't in a document somewhere. Um, you can't really grasp it, but every line of code should be simple, easy to change, and it should not inf uh, affect other parts of your system. That's the only thing you need to take care of. Just keep it simple. So what about the architects? When we fired the 15 plus architects, we spared no one. And we decided architecture is something we are all doing. It's a shared responsibility. So how, we, how do we do this? We have a tribe. Each team has one architect tribe member. 
and they rotate within the team, and they brainstorm together, and they create a vision. Those team members um, need to convince the product owner to prioritize technical depth stories and tech stories. So I think every project is struggling with, um, you want to do every story has to be functional, but there are also things like install a new application server. or Those stories, um, you need to do that. You need to sometimes upgrade uh, from Wildfly 9 to Wildfly 10. And we need to convince our product owner. So we think it's our responsibility to, to get it on the, on the backlog and to get it in the correct position. Sometimes functionality is important, but this is also important. We organize code camps with all the teams, uh, with all the members of the team, and that's where we spread the vision. So whenever the, the, the tribe uh, thinks of something new, we can, we can talk about it in code camp and show the ideas in the code camp. But who organizes those tribe meetings in the, co in the code camps? What if there's a stalemate situation where there's like a 50-50 split and we can't make a decision? And who's responsible for spreading a vision? You know what? We need someone for this. Maybe an architect. So that's something, <laughs> that's something we've, we've had. An architect, he or she leaves. Then we say, ah, oh, we can do it ourselves. And after some time, we realize, oh, it's better if there's someone who's responsible for this. And then we assign a new architect. And they don't last very long. After a year, they leave again. Right now, we're currently without an architect. I, I, my personal opinion, even after writing this, was we, we need someone that's responsible for this. Because we have self-organizing teams. And don't get me wrong, I think self-organizing teams are great. If you want something, make it happen. You have the freedom. That's, that's, that should be the goal of a self-organizing team. If I want to experiment with, name something, uh, Wildfly Swarm, that's what I do. I install it, I test it, I work with it. And if, if, if I think it's something that adds to, to what we're doing, I spread it in the code camp and I talk about it. And that's something I'm at that point passionate about and I want to share that and I want to find more, uh, find out more about it. But there's also an obvious drawback um, because we found out that shared responsibility often means no responsibility. If there are things that aren't that cool, that isn't very good or fun to, to tackle, well, it's our responsibility, not mine. And if everyone thinks that, nobody, nobody picks it up. Nobody's going to do that. And that's especially with the architect. Some architectural problems are hard. They're not fun. So. What we currently see in our project, nobody, nobody wants to do those things. So we had some problems uh, two years ago. Our deployment cycle with one backend, one front end, it, it was just taking too long. The build itself was taking long. And for each change, we couldn't go into production for each change. We had to wait an entire sprint, two weeks. Then we could go into production. And when we needed to patch something, it was. And we were stuck with old technology. We had one swing application and a huge pile of EGBs, and that's it. Hamis was no longer sexy. We couldn't get any developers. If I went to my contracting co workers and I said, oh, we need a good developer, maybe you, you can join us. Oh, what are you doing? Well, we have a swing application. Ah, no. <laughs> Uh, seriously, but that's a problem. If you can't get good, uh, good programmers, you're doomed. So that was basically the main reason we started to do microservices, because first of all, we could uh, have new technologies. And it, it was sexy again. So we started out with a basic three-tier design of the application. The back end was made up three-tier. After that, we switched to a hexagonal design. Um, who here is familiar with the hexagonal design? Okay, I'll come to that later. And like I said, 
next is microservices. This is basically how the hexagonal design looks like. Um, in the middle is your main application. And at the borders, you have the communication to external systems. So, for example, uh, this could be an email out, this could be a REST endpoint in, this could maybe a WebSocket connection. And you would put um, the things that belong together would be in a segment together. So, functionality is already um, well separated. So for us, this was pretty easy because we had already uh, gone from the tree tier into this design where we had everything, for example, with chip planning, everything was already together. It was pretty easy to just take that, put it in a microservice. So how did we do that uh, tran uh, translation, uh, transition? In our Swing application, every panel we replaced that with something called a JX browser, which is basically a Chrome browser. And inside that panel, we would just be running an Angular app or Meteor app. And JX browser itself, using JavaScript, you can communicate between Swing and JavaScript. So this makes it easy for us to have a smooth transition. So panel for panel, we can replace um, our old Swing layout with Angular. And in the back end, even better, we could just cut from the monolith. So we could just take a, 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 a brick of uh, uh, functionality, put it in a microservice. Database-wise, well, we had a big clustered Oracle database, and we decided to keep it for now. We do, for each microservice, make a separate schema. So the data is separated. We could install another database, we could use another data store, but yeah, why would we? We've already got the data and it's there and it's already functionally separated. So That's something we might do in the future, but we don't know yet. So at the moment, we've got 20 plus microservices, some running on Wildfly, some running on Wildfly Swarm, and some running on Spring Boot. Uh, the main reason we have Wildfly and Wildfly Swarm is because the old application was Java EE, so when we cut from that monolith, we just take the EE and put it back in EE, which is much simpler. For the new projects, um, yeah, teams are free to choose. Some choose Spring Boot, just because they like developing Spring Boot. And we've got 10 plus um, Angular projects, which are running in NGINX Angular 2. We still have the backend left over, and we still have the front end left over. Like I said, teams are picking their own technology, and this is good, because they have freedom, creativity, and they can use state-of-the-art technology. But like I said, it isn't all good. We found that microservices deteriorate much faster. When we had one big backend application, every time we decided to upgrade something, we would do it for everything. So at every point in time, the entire application was at the same level. Right now, well, we don't touch microservices. So for example, something we made two years ago, it's running in production, we never touch it. So we've got one Meteor application, a couple of Angular 1 applications, a couple of Angular 2 applications, we just don't touch it. That's the idea of microservices. They are disposable. And next time when we need to, do, to make a change to some of those microservices, we might just make it again in Angular 2, or we might upgrade it to Angular 2, but at the moment, well, we'll just leave it. I'm still not convinced that's better, um, but hey, it's what we do. And we've noticed even more drawbacks, because a lot of code now is being duplicated, and um, for example, our daytime pickers, um, that kind of stuff is being duplicated over microservices. That's easy, but also helps with the deterioration, because if there's a bug, we don't go back and fix the bug in every application, we just fix it where, where it happens. Yeah, that, that isn't a good thing, but yeah, it's, it's, it's what we have. Monitoring's much harder, 
we had one backend, it worked or it didn't. But right now there are a lot of microservices and all of them have uh, connections, either REST or uh, using MQ. And yeah, sometimes one is broken and you can't really find which one. And so you need to pay much more attention to, to monitoring. One thing we've seen is that also the code style is diverging. When we were all working in the same code base of the, of the back end and uh, the front end, we, we were all basically doing the same code style. But right now, every team only works on his or her uh, microservice. And well, yeah, the Spring Boot guys are doing it in the Spring Boot way, and we are doing it in, uh, in the Wildfly Swarm way. And yeah, even our knowledge and coding style is diverging, which is also something I didn't see coming, but yeah, that's obvious and likely to happen. But So another lesson learned. Um, this is something I noticed when we were breaking up our monolith. You start with a very easy piece, something that's already like almost separated. You take it away, put it in a microservice, and you work your way down. So you keep doing that, you keep taking a piece, put it in a microservice. That sounds good, right? The problem is, what are you leaving behind? Because in our case, we have one big piece which has to do with vessels. Obviously, everything we do has something to do with vessels. So everything's connected to that vessel part. It's a complicated thing. We decided not to use that as the first thing to extract because it's tied to everything. So the decision was made, if we remove everything, then that's left, then it's a microservice. But yeah, it sounds obvious, but um, the thing is, everyone's removing parts and they aren't thinking about the design of the thing they're leaving. So that thing already had, I don't know, nine or 10 different REST APIs. But yeah, that's not something you want. That's not the last thing. It's, isn't You don't want to have something with, with maybe 20 different APIs. So what we decided to do is to make an internal API and already start thinking about this API. So instead of just removing it, we would uh, try to protect it by making a new API and all the microservices that are removed talk to that API and not the old way or a new way. Just make sure um, you leave something clean behind. Who here is familiar with Conway's law? I've seen it on other slides, on other presentations as well. And Conway says, um, Organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs with are copies of their communication structure of these organizations. So basically, if you look at someone's code, you can pretty much tell um, what kind of uh, design team did that. We found out, it's my law, organizations which radically change their system design should also expect changes in communication structure. The other way around. That's one thing I really didn't expect. Um, but the decision to go to microservices changed our teams. The teams are now not, no longer responsible for the entire thing. So if the build breaks in some microservice and they don't own it, whatever. And that really changes the team dynamic. The teams are only working on their own project so, yeah, when they go out for lunch, they only lunch with only five people uh, yeah, they're working with, and they're no longer working with all the other guys. So the way we communicate and the way our team works has really changed by adopting microservices. That was something I, I really didn't expect. But, yeah, when you think of it, it's obvious. But, hey, we are familiar with Cargo Cult. This is a tribe in, uh, in Melanesia. And just before the Second World War, they had no technology, no Western goods, nothing. Then suddenly the Second World War came and there were planes and the planes were dropping um, supplies and they were landing and they had goods and the tribe was overwhelmed. All of a sudden they wanted it too. Second World War ended, the planes went away 
And the tribe was like, wait, how do we get these planes back? You know what? If we make wooden planes and if we make runways, the planes will come to us. That's how it works, right? But yeah, it didn't, obviously. So what has this to do with IT? Well, something I see a lot is this. Ooh, Spotify does X. Spotify is successful. We don't do X. If we do X, we'll be successful. And that's true, that's true, that's probably true. And yeah, that's not how it works, right? Um, same thing also with survivorship bias. If you go to your grandparents and they've got old toys, I can guarantee you the thing they will say is, back in the old day, they made everything much better. Toys didn't break as easy as they do today. That's not true. Toys broke 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. But the, you'd never see those toys because they're broken. Maybe some of the toys my kids have will be around for 50, 60 years. And I will also say, oh, the toys they made in 2017, oh, they were much better. They were much. But you only see the ones that survived. And the most famous example of survivorship bias was also in the Second World War. They had new engines for the planes, and they could add more armor to the planes. So what did they do? Every time a plane returned, they would note down where it had been shot. And this was uh, an image of where the plane had been shot. So the general said, I want armor right here on the tips and here, because that's where we got shot. Then an, uh, uh, a smarter guy came along. He says, well, wait, you probably want the armor here and here and here. The general says, why? <laughs> why should I? No one, <laughs> no one has ever shot there. So the smart guy says, yeah, some planes were shot there, but they never returned. So that's where you need to put the armor. <laughs> On these spots, a plane can just fly back. So that isn't very critical. This also applies to IT. I've already heard like three talks today on how successful a project with microservices was. And we forget two things. Nobody talks about the failed projects that are using microservices. And there are more successful projects not doing microservices than that those who are doing microservices. But we tend to forget that because we only see the success stories. And that's why I wanted to talk this story. It isn't a success story. We're doing OK. But yeah, it's not perfect. It's far from perfect. Because if you look at the present day, when I return on Monday, uh, we'll be in Sprint 168. We'll be working on this project for over a decade. And we still have a lot of problems. We've got big, scary things that are left unfinished. So like I said, we are moving from panel to panel to Angular 2. But if we do that, we will always need the Swing application, because that's the one who's hosting all the browsers. And we have no idea how to get rid of the Swing application. Basically, we have no vision whatsoever on how, how we're going to solve that. So we are now blindly making all those new panels, but And we've got our other big, scary things that no one is, feels responsible for, and that's the biggest problem. We have nobody that feels responsible for problems like that. My opinion is we just need to assign someone and make that someone responsible for that. Call him or her the architect. Problem is solved. Because his or her job will be to talk about those things. His or her job is to have a vision about that about the architecture and about the product. And that's something we, we, we really don't have. I don't have the answers for you. I only have questions. But in the end, you know, we'll be OK. <laughs> we'll keep evolving. Um, if you have questions or answers for me, because I've got questions, raise your hand. Talk about it. Well, um, ooh, let's see if I can do a demo, which is also... We're using Swing, yes. Uh, what? 
yeah, the, the question is, uh, we're using Swing. Um, and how is that, why is that difficult to, to move away from? Um, basically, we, when we want to, to migrate, we want to do it gradually. So we, if we want to replace everything and make it one big Angular 2 application, for example, it would take two or three years. Basically, that's our estimate. It would take two or three years to completely redo the entire UI. So the only way we can currently do it is panel by panel. But that isn't really solving the problem, because we still have Swing, we still have those panels, we can still dock it. Um, are there any other questions? Well, I tried to... Other questions, other questions. In the back. What's the reason we chose Angular? Uh, uh, basically, uh, we left the teams um, in charge, so every team for itself can pick a technology. And yeah, for some reason we went with Angular. Um, it's quite popular, especially in the Netherlands. I think it's it's the de facto web application at the moment. Um, so that made the choice easier. Uh, there's just a lot of people already working on uh, working with Angular 2, so for us that was the natural choice. Um, yeah, so that was the natural, yes? Are you gonna handle the offline functionality in web? Good question. People forgot about that. That's a true story. Uh, people forgot that Angular uh, isn't offline available. So basically, the things that need to be offline available, because not the entire application needs to be offline available, the checklist, for example, is still Swing. Um, we just haven't migrated that yet, but that's something we don't know. That's one of those big, scary things nobody wants to talk about. <laughs> don't you think that reduced, uh, reducing the choice of uh, frameworks will uh, uh, be a, a good decision to reduce the technical debt? Um, the question is, um, if you reduce the amount of technology you're using, um, maybe one web framework instead of three, um, isn't that a way to reduce technical debt? Well, yes, but if we pick one now, in five years, it will, yeah, it will be outdated. Nobody will be wanting to do Angular 2 in five years. So that's why we decided, well, let's just ditch it all together. Um, I've started the application. Let's just have complete freedom. So now you can get an idea on what it is that we're working on. I need to. It's in Dutch. So that's. Uh, I want to show the map. The, the map's the coolest part. So this is Rotterdam at this moment in time. And the fun thing is, I'm, if I'm in the office and I watch outside, I could literally see the ships uh, go by. Our office is based here, and this is a ship, for example, and we can just check it with all the details of the ship. And this entire map, this is something we created in, uh, in, uh, in Swing. So this is all 100% our own code, which probably isn't the best thing to do, but it was a fun, uh, fun exercise. Um, so yeah, other questions? We have five minutes left. How are you guys dealing with the front and back end communication now that you have microservices? Yeah, uh, the microservices itself, uh, like I said, most of them are um, Angular pages. Um, so we, we try, every, every time we make something new, uh, it's an Angular 2 application and the logic goes into a microservice and it's pretty tightly connected to the, to the page itself or to the application itself. And we do REST calls. So basically the Angular does REST calls to the backend and the microservices uh, between each other, sometimes they can do REST calls, uh, but if you want guaranteed stuff, you'll probably want to do uh, MQ messaging. So, uh, communication between microservices is MQ. So, you're starting to drop the serialization? Yep. The yep. So, the only serialization Hessian call that we still have is, uh, is with the old backend and, uh, and, and, uh, and the swing uh, GUI. Yep. So, that's one thing we're getting rid of. 
and also the state itself. I said there was some shared state, <coughs> which was mostly used, for example, in the map to have one node calculate all the new positions, and it was shared with the other. Um, that shared state is also has to go uh, eventually, so that's one thing we are we are working on. So, someone uh, put a pin here. You can actually see information. I think this is actually an Angular page, but you, yeah, you you wouldn't recognize it. This is Swing. This is Swing. This might be Angular. Sometimes it's even hard to see. Um, wait. This is definitely an Angular page because it just looks a couple of years newer. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that kind of stuff is cool. Yep. Yeah. One question. Yeah, there. Yes, the question is, if, if the teams develop their UI independently, how do you make uh, a, a user experience? Well, that's uh, the same thing as with uh, the database guy. We have one database guy. We also have one UI expert, um, she in this case. Um, when you're going to create something new like this screen, we work with her and the users, and together we make a design, and that's, that's what we're using. We also have a style guide, which is nothing more than uh, a couple of components, what they should look like, and we try to to make it look like those components. And yep. How do we handle authentication? How do we handle authentication? Um, security isn't our strongest point. <laughs> 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 to fire up the Swing application, you need authentication. Um, but after that, all the rest calls. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, if you're uh, connected to the VPN, like I am currently, then you can do all the rest calls uh, in production. But it isn't, it isn't really a problem for us, because most data is, is, is readily available anyway. For example, the, the map data, you, you can get it online. Um, there are certain things that we are, uh, we are hiding, uh, certain things. If an inspector says something about um, a ship, that is secured. So there are some parts of the application which are secure, but most of it, we really don't care. There are stories left to, to do that, but yeah. Yep. Yeah, so the question is, I, I said the communication structure of the teams have changed, and is that a problem? Um, I think it is a problem. Uh, some people don't think it's a problem. Some people like it. Uh, we have some people that have suggested maybe uh, the teams could even go to different locations and work from their own office and work like little companies. I'm not a fan of that. I, I, I like being around a lot of people and having some shared responsibility, shared feeling. But um, during the making of this presentation, that's where I really noticed this is actually happening. So now that I know this, I am going to put more effort into to creating, uh, to doing things together. So for example, Monday, we've got a meeting planned with the entire team and just to, to discuss things with all the teams. And I think this is something we took for granted, that we had a very strong team with 20, 25 people. But now that we're losing it, um, yeah, you really, yeah, because the decision to go to microservices, we're starting to lose that, and we need to work on that again. So we need to put extra effort in. I saw another question there. Yep. Yeah, um, the question is about continuous integration with all those different technologies. Um, we have pipelines for everything in Jenkins. Uh, everything's built uh, with one push of a button. Uh, so that's something, automation is very high on our list. That's what we always try to do. And yeah, that's, uh, it's never really been a problem. Every time we make something, we make a new pipeline in Jenkins and we can copy it for the new frameworks. And that works very good. 
So, yeah, that's one thing we are doing very well. Automation, yep. Yeah. How do you deal with the synchronization of data? Okay. Um, the question is, how do you deal with the synchronization of data? Because uh, we are separating the schemas. We don't duplicate it. We separate it out. So every, every microservice has its own logic, has its own data. Um, so it isn't duplicated and synchronized in any way. So it's just separated out in different schemas. But time is up. If you have questions, come here and... and, uh, and if you have answers, I'd love those even more.